Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. And I want to welcome you just before the holidays to take in some not so common knowledge that should be, and we should be using this in our practice every day. Many of you are, many of you may not be. So if you're not, this is definitely an actionable step that you should incorporate into your practice immediately. If you are using it, congratulations. Here's a review on how it should be done and done correctly. And when uh, once we get done with this episode, we will post a live version of what I'm going to describe here in the Facebook page. It was taken live from our live course in and video there in the live course. So you'll have a video on exactly how to do this procedure, and then you'll have all the adjunct slides that you can see. And I'll explain that as I go, uh, starting right now. So imagine that you're looking at a maxillary canine tooth. You've got the tooth, you've got that big zone of attached gingiva just above the tooth, and then above that you have a line that separates that attached gingiva with the unattached gingiva, which is uh, dorsal to it. And then at the base of that attached gingiva, close to the crown of the tooth, is your sulcus or your, your periodontal pocket or your po normal pocket or, or your periodontal pocket if it's abnormal. <clears throat> and then imagine placing your probe in that pocket, in, in a normal pocket where there's no changes, and that may go two, three, four millimeters, depending on the wide, how wide that attached gingiva is and what tooth it is. But that really doesn't matter as much as if, if you pass it and there's no bleeding, then that's a normal pocket. But if you pass it, regardless of how deep that pocket is and it bleeds, that tells you that there's granulation tissue in the base of that pocket. And it tells you that there's granulation tissue lining that pocket which is normally lined by gum tissue, the same tissue that is the attached gingiva. So when, when periodontal disease steps in and those gram-negative anaerobes start to cause inflammation in that pocket, the base of the pocket, which is what attaches the tooth to the, the, the bone or the junctional epithelium, is starts to get inflamed and it turns into inflamed granulation tissue and the same thing happens on the lining of that pocket. So if we leave that and just clean the tooth and clean under the gum and we don't do anything to alter that granulation tissue when we come back in six months, 12 months, that pocket's going to be deeper and eventually it's going to reach beyond that mucogingival line and once it does, that becomes an extraction. So we want to stop that. We want to stop it in its tracks ahead of time. And we have plenty of opportunity to do that in many of our patients that we see in our general practice, especially those small breed dogs, 20 pounds or less. And it gets worse as we get down in poundage, if you will, uh, if that's a word. Uh, so 10 pound dogs, worse, five pound dogs, even worse. And those changes can happen as early as a year of age or even earlier in some of those smaller breeds. So we want to be watching for that. We want to be probing and checking pocket depths, more specifically, not just depth, but we want to find out, is that a bleeding pocket? If it is, it's abnormal. And we need to clean it out. If we clean it out, we can expect that that 
tissue that is in the sulcus will reattach to the bone or the or uh, the uh, the gum tissue or I'm sorry to to the bone and that gum tissue will reestablish as epithelium whereas now in an abnormal pocket is granulation tissue the epithelium has been eroded away so we want that reestablishment of that normal epithelium there so that it can reattach and where we had a five millimeter pocket before that bled, when we come back, hopefully we'll have a two or three millimeter pocket that doesn't bleed. And that's what we're after as far as preventing the progression and actually going back to where we were previously and reestablishing that normalcy with a normal pocket that is less in depth than the abnormal pocket. So that all prevents that progression to bone loss. So in order to do that, what we need to do is use our periodontal curette. And that periodontal curette has a blade that is sharp on only one edge. And it has the mirror blade on the other end of the instrument. I know that you all have that instrument in your practice. It may be in a drawer collecting dust and hasn't been used in years. And it could be where it's as dull as a butter knife. <laughs> And that's that's not too uncommon based on the in, uh, the uh, input we get from our live courses that they don't they have those but they don't use them or they don't know how to use them and they don't know the the effect of the end use of that and how effective that is at preventing the progression of periodontal disease. So if you have that, uh, get it out of that drawer if you're not using it. Get a dental hygienist that knows how to sharpen instruments to sharpen that and then. And hopefully that hygienist can show your staff how to sharpen that instrument and other instruments correctly and get started on the right track. And that this is an action step for this week. Get that instrument, find it, and get it sharpened so that you can start using it and preventing the progression on these patients rather than getting them back and having to extract teeth six months, 12 months, two years later that could have been prevented with just that one little hand, hand instrument. So the way to determine which edge of each side of that instrument is the correct edge, you just hold that instrument vertically with the toe of that instrument facing you. And you'll notice that there's an angle to that blade. And that angle is either be, going to be to the left where it's lower on the left, or it's going to be to the right where it's lower on the right. Whichever side that is that's lower, that's the cutting edge for that side of that instrument. The opposite is true on the, if you flip that instrument around, the opposite is true for the other cutting edge of, the, of that instrument. So I'm going to post this in Facebook so you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. Many of you can visualize that. Many of you know and are familiar with that instrument so you know that there is only one side that cuts and it's always the lower side as you look at the toe. That's the side that wants to, you want to put on the root when you're cleaning the root adjacent to that granulation tissue. And that is the side that you want to use against the granulation tissue in the pocket at the base and also to scrape the lining of that pocket to free it of that granulation tissue and expose the connective tissue underneath so that, that connective tissue can react. So that instrument is used primarily for that. And the term that you use that you can apply to that and also that I would strongly recommend you immediately put into your dentistry service sheet and charge for it is called closed root planing. And so with closed root planing, what we're doing is we're root planing by scraping the disease cementum or the calculus or debris, plaque, whatever's in that sulcus adjacent to the tooth, we're straight scraping that out with the sharp edge against the tooth side. And then we're using the sharp edge against the tissue, which is called subgingival curatage. So closed root planing consists of root planing and subgingival curatage. So I would suggest you put that in your fee sheet most people charge eight to twenty dollars for that procedure per tooth. And once you're done with cleaning that out, which again, we'll have a video on the Facebook page at Vet Dental Show. Uh, uh, you can you can search that on Facebook in Facebook Just search Vet Dental Show and we'll come up. Uh, you can also 
go to facebook.com slash vet hyphen dental hyphen show. But it's probably going to be easier just to search. Once you get there, subscribe, and you'll be able to see that video and see uh, that, that live recording that we did at one of the wet labs that really show this really well. So that alone will provide a tremendous increase in the quality of your dentistry service. It'll definitely pay for itself very quickly with charging for those procedures, and it'll benefit the patient tremendously going forward. So take those with you. Use those as our holiday gift. Incorporate them into your practice, and that gift is for your patients and for your clients. And they will thank you for that preemptive type of approach so that extractions down the road become minimal to non-existent. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.